Alrighty, hello everyone, folks, and good morning. Uh, welcome to a quick discussion here on magic types. So, alright, a lot of times I see folks getting into chapter 4 and just kind of coming to this conclusion that there's only one magic type worth using anymore. So I wanted to cover the many different types that are kind of uh, different purposes, uh, different uses as you carry on. Um, and especially if you're going to look into uh, completing Coda, uh, the many cases where you'd really want to just kind of consider keeping a mix of everything around uh, for different situations. So, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into this whole thingamashtick here. Uh, so, um, I'm going to cover them through just kind of the order that you end up unlocking them. And just so you know, um, when I'm referring to them, uh, missiles are going to be things like a dead shot, uh, basically just kind of, uh, you know, your direct, uh, direct fire missile abilities. Uh, splashes are going to be your basic elemental. AoEs. Um, draconics are obviously going to be Draconics. Um, Apocrypha are going to be Apocrypha. Necromancy going to be uh, just kind of considered as part of uh, both uh, missiles and splashes uh, for the most part. Um, and additionally, um, uh, we've got uh, things like summons that are also going to have multiple different versions, uh, since you do have uh, both the ninja versions as well as the regular versions. Which actually, come to think of it, I probably should have included ninja summons on this team, but whatever. Anyway, let's carry on here. Alright, so what are the purposes of all of these different types of abilities? Well, uh, basically, it all will come down to a combination of uh, range, power, cost, as well as availability. Um, so, like, let's say, starting from the very beginning, uh, something like missiles. Oftentimes I've gotten even angry messages uh, asking why I'm still using missiles on people in, you know, going through, uh, through Coda here. And simply put, it's basically the equivalent of if you've ever played any, like, XCOM, Xenonauts, anything like that, it is functionally the equivalent of your basic ballistic rifle, uh, where you're looking at a case where it's just going to be a convenient, cheap, direct-fire weapon, um, that's going to be there for picking stuff out of another group. Fairly, uh, I mean, they're all going to be accurate, but it's going to give you a way to snipe into a group. It's going to give you some additional range, and that additional uh, kind of uh, two to three tiles of range, depending on your situation, can matter quite a bit. Uh, like, for example, let's say you send somebody off to the back row to go deal with something. They ran into some trouble, or they ended up missing or getting stunned or something like that. They just barely missed an attack. Nobody else is within range or within the right trajectory to go snipe out that target that they can't finish off. Off, except suddenly wizard guy with a missile suddenly has a shot on that guy from pretty far away. So they're there for kind of corrections, for openers, they're a cheap option, they're pretty much always going to be available. Um, they're basically there with a pretty solid amount of punch. Uh, one thing that oftentimes gets missed is just the uh, uh, just the uh, kind of largeness of the effect of penetration in many of these cases, uh, where missiles are going to pretty consistently be able to get past defenses at pretty much every stage of the game, while magic is generally less resisted. Um, generally speaking, missiles are going to consistently always stay at roughly the same amount, uh, whereas, like, let's say, oftentimes they're compared with summons, which have a completely different role, uh, who have a tendency to vary wildly in terms of uh, going up or down. So anyways, missiles, again, are just there as your long-range snipe. They're good, they're cheap, they're reliable. They're not going to be your DPS option, they're going to be there as your correction option. And again, this matters a absolute ton as you get more and more uh, through the game. Early on, obviously, you don't have too many options available to you. But as you, uh, as you carry on, you'll typically get upgrades to your missile abilities first. Again, they're going to remain on the cheap end for the most part. Um, they're going to have very wide availability, and... I mean, they're going to have a lot of range on them. So you need to finish something off at long range, there you go, it's right over there. You need to uh, weaken something up before you get there, there you go, it's right there. And additionally, a lot of weapons carry free casts of these abilities as you carry on, so especially a lot of your uh, elemental uh, katanas and things like that, uh, many of the uh, swords and such will have, um, uh, will have missile abilities on there. All right, next up, let's uh, talk about splashes. So splashes are going to be your best uh, kind of damage to MP ratio of the bunch. Uh, before you start arguing about summons, we'll get to that. Don't worry about it. Um, now, as far as splashes go, the reason that I say this is because as you carry on uh, through, you know, larger and larger maps, you'll start noticing that the AI loves to clump up in order to, for example, go and block off choke points or go and block off... Uh, you know, block up staircases or go and uh, try to make use of uh, AOE buffs that they've got on hand. Um, they're programmed to constantly love to, cl to, uh, to clump up like that. Now, the reason that this ends up being useful is because those splashes are always going to hit in that area. And for the relatively cheap uh, cost of these abilities, they're going to consistently give you the best value in terms of the sheer amount of raw damage you can inflict in a wide area. They're basically your shotgun option. 
um, that they're, they are going to have pretty decently long range, especially, you know, your basic elemental versions there are going to have pretty solid range. They're going to be fairly cheap. They're going to, again, be fairly widely available. Pretty much everybody ha can have access to them. You're more or less going to be able to upgrade them on complete accident. Um, so this is just going to be a case where you'll very regularly see solid results coming out of these abilities. They oftentimes get considered to uh, drop off uh, as, uh, uh, as stuff goes on. But bear in mind, few things ever completely drop off. In most cases, uh, it can be a bit situational. As you may have noticed here, I'm still running a Lich that's still uh, uh, that's still uh, running the uh, the tier three version of um, uh, of the uh, the Ice Splash, uh, while at the same time having a lot of other more you know, technically powerful abilities available, because it's there for the purpose of economy. Um, it's a very e uh, economical amount of damage, and if we're comparing them directly with summons, uh, kind of pound for pound between the two of them, even if you use them at uh, at uh, kind of the same uh, same MP cost, as it were. Uh, like, for example, Avalanche uh, 3. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and double check that real quick. Because I believe... Yeah, so if we compare directly with Avalanche 2 and then compare that with something like Wendigo, they're going to cost the same. However, you're going to get almost double the range. And if you're hitting in a splash, you're basically going to get more out of Avalanche 2 than you would out of Wendigo 1. Obviously, again, these are going to be spells with completely different roles to play, uh, but oftentimes it's the uh, direct comparison for uh, for damage that ends up coming up. Anyway, this will do uh, this will always do more in a AOE, uh, whereas the summons will do more versus a single target, provided that you have everything lined up, uh, you have a kind of open spot to hit that target. Um, so either way, as far as economy goes, again, that's kind of what that's there for. Uh, if you're wondering in terms of damage, like basically damage wise they will more or less be a similar situation uh the summon abilities for comparison are more or less with some you know ups and downs here uh going to be the equivalent of just firing your basic missile ability or a slightly weaker version of it uh multiple times uh and it's going to be a range uh typically for the uh, for these ones it's going to be three to four and then you're going to be seeing i believe it's a uh, five to uh, seven uh, or five to eight i've heard some folks insist but typically you're seeing like six to seven uh, when it comes to the tier twos um, so in the case of uh, something like this, yeah, the splashes will always technically do more if it's against a crowd. Summons will do more against a single target. Um, okay, let's go ahead and uh, run these guys again just to keep showing this off. So the next one then, yeah, that the you'll end up uh, gaining access to um, is going to be your summons, uh, which we will take a, a quick detour to talk about uh, buffs and debuffs in a moment. Uh, but the summons, it, both in tier 1 and tier 2 variants, are going to be your single target rushdown ability. So these are going to fire a flurry of the basic missile abilities uh, on one unit. Um, they typically will be fairly economical for the amount of damage that they can bring. However, they can vary wildly in terms of how much they do. Um, so for example, like let's say you're going into Coda, there may be several cases where let's say you bring your summons there and you start realizing like, oh shoot, these things are doing like sub 100 damage. Or let's say a unit brought a shield along or something along those lines. It's one of these cases of an ability that can go, that can vary wildly, going up or down. But just like any good machine gun ability, you fire it enough, eventually stuff dies. This is why they typically have a tendency to be fairly popular. Um, but either way, uh, if you have a single target that's available, that's going to be their uh, their primary role. Uh, they've got uh, solid uh, uh, solid availability in terms of who can use them. Uh, so, for example, you've got uh, your rune fencers. You've got your um, uh, you've got uh, your uh, uh, what's it the Shamans, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, you've got your uh, uh, liches, as well as... I want to say there were a couple of others I could use them. Outside of unique classes, I'm sure there's uh, there's a couple more that I'm just completely blanking on, them on at the moment. It's been it's been a bit of a funny morning. Anyway. Anyway, so... Uh, so yeah, that's entirely their purpose. You need an opening in order to, uh, uh, to have them do their full effect. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to, let's say, combine... Lament of the Dead, along with a um, uh, along with a uh, summon, you might have a harder time doing it, depending on the situation, because you might hit your own guys. Uh, whereas, for example, if you were to combine a Lament of the Dead with a Splash, you basically can target the, the unit that did the Lament of the Dead in the first place, give them a resistance to the element in question, and you potentially could have a unit that's kind of adding a uh, sort of... Uh, it kind of works a little bit like the uh, uh, the AOE abilities, the kind of self AOE abilities fencers get in one vision. Uh, if you were to uh, combine a, a splash caster as well as a, a Terranite, um, but basically fear will reduce all uh, reduce all defenses across the board. 
so they can potentially uh, serve as the lightning rod to see a lot of units get uh, run down very quickly. Uh, whereas with something like summons, you might be able to get one or two of them. But again, it depends. It d entirely depends on what you're running into. Uh, they have their heyday quite a bit in Chapter 4, uh, wherein you're kind of running into that moment where a lot of things are, let's say, like you're going through, uh, through temples and such, and it's they have a little bit of a spike at that point. Uh, pretty much as soon as you get any of these... Wow. Words are hard. As soon as you get any of these abilities, they're always going to have a little bit of a spike in terms of their usefulness. It's a little bit of a sales trick uh, from the devs there. Um, but basically around Chapter 4 is typically when they uh, become available is when... Well, no, I say typically. It's just when they become available. Um, uh, and by the way, just to throw this out there, you don't need to go through uh, Palace of the Dead in order to get summons. You can actually get them uh, from Hanging Gardens themselves. Um, anyway, so... They're going to be good for rushdowns, not necessarily as good against uh, larger crowds. Um, and again, past Chapter 4, especially the Tier 1s, start to drop off fairly quickly because while they are very consistent in terms of their minimum amount, they're very inconsistent in terms of, of their maximum amount. Um, and basically, health pools start uh, rocketing up a decent bit at that point, as does defense. Um, so again, they're very kind of up and down is the thing. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue on and talk about uh, other uh, uh, other stuff here. Uh, so Draconics. Oftentimes it can seem weird to see something have such like overall crappy economy to, uh, to damage there. So what's its purpose? Uh, it's essentially a snipe splash. Um, so the purpose of Draconics, especially in the Tier 2 variants, is just that they're going to have the highest range in the game. Uh, they're basically going to have missile range on a, uh, on, uh, on a splash ability. Uh, with higher penetration roughly equivalent to the uh, higher ends of those splash abilities. Uh, so there's essentially they will, um, uh, their overall penetration will be better, their range will be far better, um, and, however their actual access is pretty deeply limited by that point. Um, you've basically just got witches and warlocks and unique classes that uh, gain access to uh, draconics. Um, they're going to be generally less available. Uh, you generally will see bosses using them a lot more because they have a tendency to combine in with melee classes, giving that extra range a kind of chance to shine. If you ever wondered why they were kind of sniping you from out of range, it's because they were using Draconics. Um, but anyways, uh, they've got uh, they've got terrible economy overall, but they've uh, but they're going to be uh, kind of a kind of handy for those uh, those very particular situations uh, where you need to be able to snipe something at long range and. Oftentimes, I find it really handy to uh, to pop those uh, uh, pop those on here and there, just for the purpose of like th they're better at taking uh, taking advantage of particular weaknesses. I guess is the is the best way to put it, because you'll just notice a clump off in the distance and nobody else can quite reach it. But then you've got your draconic eye to uh, to handle that job. Um, okay, next up we talk about apocrypha stuff. So this is so apocrypha is going to be um, essentially the uh, the highest hitting stuff. And also the most, uh, okay, it's, it's questionable whether it's the most annoying to get a hold of. They're actually not that difficult to get a hold of. Um, if you're doing uh, temples and things like that, you've got access to those, I mean, pretty darn easily. The tier one versions are not terribly impressive, but they are very easy to get a hold of. Um, the, uh, the tier twos, however, are a 5% drop rate from the Coda variant of the temples, um, which, uh, yeah, as... As you've noticed, uh, right now what we're doing is I, I've already picked up uh, I've already picked up Aeroflux. I'm trying to get the Talons in this particular situation, uh, just for the purpose of that 100% uh, completion. Um, uh, but basically, they're uh, they're going to have the hardest punch of any magic stuff, especially in an AOE. Um, but they are going to be by far the most expensive. They are going to be fairly difficult to get a hold of. Um, they're mostly there as a sort of min max for your kind of uh, favorite casters, as it were. So, like for example, I, uh, I have a drumstick over there, the ice lich, um, and more or less, whenever he gets um, a nature's touch and engulf at the same time, usually a team is losing half to 100% of their health. Like it, it's nutty in terms of how much they can actually hit. Um, but very few units can make effective use of them. Um, so, for example, using them on, on shamans is kind of pointless, just because they don't really have the uh, the MP generation in order to make that happen. Honestly, and I, I say pointless, but basically, shamans are kind of specifically designed as the summoner class. So, like, tier 1 and 2 summons, they can keep that combination running all day for the most part. Usually, they'll start off with a, uh, with a bit of a charge up. Uh, and then typically run tier 1s until meditate rolls into a tier 2. Um, so either way, 
it's essentially they are the magic machine gunner in this uh, in the case of something like uh, apocrypha stuff that's usually something you want to use a lich for uh, just because life force is going to give them uh, that life force plus meditation will essentially give them the means of actually sustaining that kind of uh, kind of ability like I said, they're very, very expensive. It's pretty much Liches and Lord uh, that are going to be your primary uses for them. Um, one little side note that I should mention as well, uh, Starfall 1 and 2, as well as Heaven Judge 1 and 2, um, there's a few classes that can use them, and that would be the exception to that role, where like even something like, um, uh, like let's say, a Princess or something uh, running a melee setup, it's worth carrying Starfall, just because it gives you the option of, of uh, Exorcism and damage at the same time. Um, they're going to be uh, uh, really useful abilities for that particular situation. Um, so, like, let's say you have cases where you've got multiple skeletons that just, that just barely survived a attack that was supposed to see them exercised, or, for example, you forgot to bring an exorcist and you want to uh, you want to see about collecting some extra drops going through POTD or something. Um, and just having that there on a hybrid type of unit is going to be handy for just making sure that you're still getting those items or be able to, uh, uh, to kind of finish off multiple skeletons without having to take any extra turns to do so. Um, so both Starfall and Heaven Judge actually do function the same. They worked differently back in PSP, so if you are coming from the PSP side of things, they do work differently this time around, uh, wherein for PSP, um, they were... Um, uh, they, they were. Uh, it was. A, it was a case where Starfall could exercise but not kill. Uh, Heaven Judge uh, could do both. This time around, they both do uh, the uh, the same function of both exercise and kill functions at the same time. Um, anyway, so uh, and again, each of these abilities will have different uh, uh, different kind of use cases uh, for when you want to go and apply them. Uh, like the the missiles and splashes are fairly obvious, just like basic magic damage type stuff. So if you want to apply it faster, you use a basic wizard. Um, if you want to um, uh, it, to apply it at longer range, you, uh, you uh, well, you still use a basic wizard. <laughs> if you want to uh, uh, to uh, to use it as a cheap economy thing, that's when you'd use it on your more advanced casters. Um, like there's always the argument to be made that you know basic caster versus lich, like who technically does more. Um, if it really comes to the point that the advanced caster can actually do two times more than the basic uh, wizard there, then you could make that argument over um, over that being the better quote-unquote like DPS option, just because conserve RT makes them cast a lot faster, which kind of scales up as the game goes on, as their abilities get more and more expensive. Um, anyway, we're getting a little bit off track here. Uh, main thing I want to get across is you've noticed here I've got uh, two rune fencers uh, running tier two summons. So, like, in the case of, like, Shaman versus Fencer, personally, I find it way more consistent to have a unit that can both physically attack as well as uh, cast those summons for free rather than just kind of hoping for uh, for better range and stuff like that. Um, anyway, it, again, this all comes down to personal preference, so you do whatever you find comfortable. Um, personally, I prefer units with a bit more bulk. So, as far as, uh, as, far as all this stuff goes, um, let's go on to the next ones here, uh, which are... Uh, uh, which are going to be the buffs and debuffs. So as far as buffs and debuffs go, uh, they've got multiple different functions to them. Um, so we can start off with the... Uh, I guess we should probably just start off with the instills. Uh, basically, that's going to be anywhere from a... Uh, uh, like I think it's a 20 to 30% bonus, depending on the interactions in question, um, uh, to whatever attack you did. So you may have noticed uh, Canopus is regularly just adding an extra 100 or so to his attacks over there, um, depending entirely on what he ends up hitting. So usually the uh, what I consider the most kind of safe option as far as uh, um, instills go uh, they, since they function as both offense and defense um, is going to be something along the lines of giving them the instill that they are weak to so for example uh, in his case he's using El Colos so he's going to automatically uh, use wind um, but let's say we have someone like Bayon over here who's going to be using instill lightning so like with the uh, with the instill ability uh, this gives him uh, this will get only give him like I think it's like 20, 19, 20 ish percent uh, extra damage on top of whatever attack he's doing as a secondary tick, um, but it'll also give him defense against lightning. Um, so you can also just match your own elements to get more out of that secondary damage tick. Uh, basically, if the enemy is weak to it and you are strong while using it, it goes up to about 30% or so, um, and then just kind of anywhere in between, depending on who's strong or weak against what. Um, personally, this is why I prefer the defensive option, because it's just consistently there to give you a constant uh, kind of a effect there. Um, 
but again, use that as you will. If you have a, if you primarily are just uh, having somebody that wants to min max for 100% of whatever they can possibly do, then you'd want to give them, you know, the instill that ends up matching that. It's so, like theoretically the maximum possible hit that somebody could actually do. Funnily enough, would more than likely probably come from a, uh, a longbow running dragon slayer or something like that. Um, where I mean, I've, I've shown before how you can break the damage cap with a basic out of the shop rookie and whatnot. Um, but theoretically, if you were to combine, let's say, that instill ability plus a, a plus like let's say slayer ability uh, plus a um, uh, plus a bonus on top of a bow. Uh, main reason that I was considering the bow bonus uh, higher than a bane bonus. Uh, it was just because they, like, with Slayer, they're already getting past defenses, and I figure from just kind of random testing here and there, it seemed to me like the uh, uh, the uh, the racial uh, bonus off the uh, weapon was doing a bit more than the actual uh, Bane bonus. Again, th honestly, this is a situation that benefits absolutely no one, because once you break the damage cap, what the hell is the point? <laughs> you can't do any higher anyway, but it was, like, theoretically, like... 27 to 30k depending on the situation um, but anyway point being whatever you ended up hitting you know that extra 10% might suddenly matter in that situation obviously it depends everything always depends personally I would consider a mix of all of these uh, things put together at the same time uh, is going to always give you some kind of benefit to some degree um, anyway uh, like, like you may notice right here I have um, I have the, uh, uh, the Valkyrie over there running uh, free fireballs even though she doesn't get any additional uh you know, bonus off of uh, using it and stuff like that, just because it gives her a little bit of an extra snipe in case Meditate doesn't roll, and if it does roll, she ends up using her own personal abilities, um, uh, or if her uh, Conserve MP ends up rolling, then she just ends up going for the summon instead. It just kind of, uh, instead of relying on plan A, we've got plan A, B, and C all just kind of lined up to happen at the same time, and plan A is already guaranteed. So, either way, it just kind of allows for, well, I guess plan C is guaranteed in that case. Either way, you get the general idea. So you kind of always want to have something available, always want to have some kind of benefit uh, that you can uh, take advantage of. Because if you're only locking yourself into one, you know, spell type, you may notice those situations where, yeah, you know, it would have been great to have some extra range on a splash over in that direction. Or that guy over there just picked up a crit. He could easily missile snipe that guy if he had that ability on him, but unfortunately he doesn't have enough range to make it happen, so he's just waiting to do it uh, some other time there. Again, obviously all of this will will depend so just like everything else everything always depends with this game you know um so hopefully that was handy uh, oh actually no we're not done yet what am i talking about uh okay other buffs and debuffs uh so debuff wise uh i've talked about these at nauseum at this point uh, but uh, as far as debuffs go uh typically something like paralysis uh and something like sleep i find particularly useful on something like a terror knight um, just, uh, just because of that situation that they've got concentration on them, that's going to give them minimum 30% hit odds. Um, and it's a unit that's already going to be getting free MP from just fighting stuff in the front. Um, and typically they've, I mean, their main role is to sit there and scare things with Lament. So if they're going and doing that job already, you know, might as well just give them a cudgel, give them a little bit of extra range, have them snipe with some debuffs, uh, throw some delays on the other party. No matter how high the uh, stat discrepancies go throughout Coda, it's still going to be useful uh, to have those 30% uh, hit odds. It's still going to uh, to be handy uh, to be able to uh, do all of that stuff on there. Um, so either way, it's very uh, very consistently useful. They remain at the same kind of hitting odds uh, as you go on, you know, in different situations. By the way, just to point this out, um, if you're wondering why she's hitting 400s on the cleric every time, that's because she's dark, he's light. You get the general idea. Um, Anyway, uh, so continuing on, uh, what else do we want to cover here? Uh, so uh, as far as other buffs go, typically you're not going to be seeing it on an auto team, but as far as uh, something like speed goes, uh, very useful, uh, honestly a lot more useful than it may potentially get credit for, depending on the situation. Though. If you have an already fast unit that's uh, speeding themselves up, you're actually going to end up, despite the obvious question in, uh, in here, um, you're typically going to see more result out of a fast unit getting faster than you will be out of a slow unit trying to get faster. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly why, uh, like why it seems to go that way. Like, for example, if you slow down an already slow unit, they're going to be just never taking a turn. However, if you try to slow down a fast unit, eh, you may not necessarily see it as much. However, if you try to speed up a fast unit, you'll suddenly see them, uh, you know, multi-rounding stuff. Whereas if you try to uh, speed up a slow unit you generally won't uh, feel it as much. I believe this is more of just a confirmation bias kind of thing. 
because a lot of the time we already expect a unit to be slow or expect a unit to be fast. So if it's already fast, it feels faster. I'm sure it's just a perspective thing. Um, but anyways, uh, slow is going to be really handy for stuff like uh, recruiting. Uh, going to be uh, really handy uh, for stuff like just making sure a you know a boss stays over there in their lane and <laughs> doesn't bother you while you deal with their health. Um, something like um, like petrification, oddly enough, uh, is actually more useful uh, for keeping enemy units alive uh, and out of the fight. So like let's say. While I typically find petrification less useful in this version, um, there are going to be a lot of cases where, like, let's say you're going through uh, uh, through the later game, you find a loot pinata somewhere, uh, somewhere on the map, and you just want to make sure to keep some of your uh, keep some of those randos from accidentally killing themselves on counters while you go and collect your free uh, free relics and stuff like that, right? So. Petrification helps a lot in those cases, or if you just want to uh, to quickly kind of throw a fight out of whack, uh, petrification will uh, will be pretty handy for that. Though the odds to hit with petrification are about the same as anything else, um, so realistically, it's just it, it's a shutdown move like any other. They just can't be knocked out of it. Again, whether you're looking for more control through something like sleep, or you want to have the option to wake them back up. Uh, you know, to potentially do something else with that situation, uh, or if you prefer petrification just to make sure that they're entirely out of the fight, that, again, that is entirely up to you. Uh, personally, I would typically prefer something like a paralytic wave, because that is a 50% chance to cause multiple units not to act, and typically will last a little bit longer. Uh, stuff like a stop and petrify don't have a tendency to last terribly long. Um, but again, you know, kind of use whatever you feel uh, fits in that situation. Usually, I think like Petra Darts and um, uh, and uh, a Stone Bloom are usually going to be more likely than the spell version. Um, either way, uh, it, we're a bit off uh, off uh, track on all of uh, all of that kind of stuff. All right, so buffs, debuffs. I'm pretty sure you get the general idea. Uh, poison just gets more value as the game goes on. You know, once you once health goes into the thousands, that damage goes into the thousands. Which means that, yeah, even with uh, with a massive level advantage, you see these guys are hitting like three, four hundreds. Well, the Century Poison will do that for you, uh, obviously, a, a decent uh, decent bit better at longer range on multiple units, uh, passively without having to go back and hit those units. It's just like its overall economy is kind of okay early on and then becomes insane by the time you're in Coda. Um, not to mention, it's just super easy to apply. Honestly, don't. The spell version is all right. Uh, the uh, the weapon version is ridiculously amazing. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, I know I'm missing something. Is the annoying part? Do we count AOE abilities like the uh, the Griffin Windshot as part of the spells? I don't think so. It's it's more of just the same AOE, but you're applying it on a bird that flies forward. Um, oh. Uh, we should cover a couple of abilities, though. So, uh, from what I've seen, Spell Strike Powder does seem to boost anything in the yellow category of abilities. Uh, so, for example, if you're uh, running a uh, Angel Knight and you weren't able to hit with those abilities, there's a pretty solid chance you'd be able to do so if uh, running some Spell Strike Powder. Um, so, give that a bit of a shot. Uh, same thing appears to be the case for the Octopus, though I can't really... I can't confirm that. It doesn't show you hit odds uh, when you're going and uh, using Poison Rain. But it feels like it works, so try that as you will, I guess. Um, let's see. Like for fairies, they're—I mean, their hit odds are practically guaranteed by uh, by the time you get to Coda anyway. So even like a basic rando fairy will usually almost never miss uh, with something like a virtuous. Um, um, but yeah, everything obviously will end up uh, scaling up in different ways. Everything will act differently in different uh, portions of the game. And if you are in Chapter Four you are in that position where you're thinking summons are the only thing that matters, keep trying the other stuff. Because right now you're in the sort of sales pitch phase for summons. Stuff gets very, very different as stuff goes on. Obviously you can make anything ridiculous. Like you pick up a couple matchup cards and crit cards. Sure, you can go one shot anything with that. Um, at the same time, like you basically just go and do the same thing with a missile. Like it, Again, it all depends entirely on the situation in question. Defenses go up, um, you know, speed goes up, different types of abilities start flying your way. So there's a, there's a lot more to potentially consider. Um, so, like, uh, you may have potentially noticed that the highest hitter over the course of this party is the guy with the crossbow. <laughs> Technically, from a single hit perspective. But at the same time, you know, in terms of the AOE perspective, then the, uh, uh, then the Apocrypha and the basic elemental splashes have been winning. 
But if we're talking about the ability to delete clerics, then the, uh, the Lich with the basic summons was winning. But if we're talking about overall, like, potential here, then the, uh, uh, or overall potential versus one unit, then technically the fencers were doing their thing. Or just uh, in terms of uh, speed overall, then the fairy would have been winning. Like, you could make an argument in any direction for any one of these things, but anyway, that'll be about that. And yes, I do just have the one random guy just running around with a knife, just kind of for the hell of it. <laughs> the point of a game is to have fun, dang it. Uh, all right, y'all take care. Have yourselves a good one. And actually, no, I, I did it again. I forgot to add a thing. If you're wondering, um, the, uh, the one-handed relic bonus, uh, it's not a gigantic deal. Like, have you noticed that Bayon is still one-shotting stuff? He's not using the bonus. Have you noticed a crazy high uh, a thing from the um, uh, from the uh, generic Valkyrie that's been doing stuff too? You might have noticed, you know, some single digits going up or down here or there. But realistically, it's not enough to matter. Um, literally, the only time it matters is if you are using a particularly high-hitting ability on a unit that's already weak to it. And in most cases, by the time that you see a result out of that uh, relic effect, you probably should be one-shotting it anyway. Um, it's again, it, it's one of these cases where it was probably just in there for flavor. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've seen, again, that, that same old argument over like, oh, you can't even use two-handed things. Like, you can do the same thing just fine. In Bane's case, he ends up hitting more physically. He ends up uh, doing more, um, you know, kind of doing more in terms of the, uh, uh, the finishers uh, from his spear. Uh, whereas the other one might technically do a little bit more uh, whenever using her summons. But still, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, I gotta get going. Y'all have shows a good one. I hope this was helpful, and take care.